and welcome to Let's Talk About It with Taylor Nolan. I'm your host and today we're going to talk about sex and it's one of my favorite topics. Um, Over the weekend, you guys might have seen, I shared a bit, I attended a workshop hosted by the Sexual Health Alliance um, whose events and programs are intended to help build community, spark dialogue, and encourage collaboration. Um, So it's not only for uh, clinical psychologists and LPCs, LMFTs, LCSWs, um, but it's also for just anyone that wants to help educate themselves around sex. Um, So they have like diverse professionals and people that are just sex nerds, basically. Um, They also provide um, certifications with ASECT. So if you want to become a certified sex therapist or educator or counselor, um, you should definitely check out their website at sexualhealthalliance.com. And so today we're going to be talking with the host of that workshop. Um, He's a research fellow at the Kinsey Institute and author of a new book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help Improve Your Sex Life. Uh, Dr. Justin Lay Miller received his PhD in social psychology from Purdue University. Um, He's received three different... um, awards uh, the Certificate of Teaching Excellence from Harvard, where he taught for several years. Um, He's a researcher and a scholar who's published more than 40 academic works to date, including a textbook titled uh, The Psychology of Human Sexuality, which is now in its second edition, and it's used in college classrooms around the world. Uh, His research focuses on so many amazing topics, and we'll get into some of them today. Um, Some of them include casual sex, sexual fantasies, sexual health, friends with benefits, Um, He's got some really interesting ones that he's working on now that we're definitely going to talk about. Um, And his studies have appeared in so many different media outlets from CNN to The Late Show with Stephen Colbert um, to all kinds of different academic sexual journals. Um, And he also, I mean, (laughs) the list goes on. He's really really doing stuff everywhere and I love it. Um, So he actually runs a very popular sex blog um, called Sex and Psychology since 2011 um, and it now receives several million uh, views per year. Um, The Sex and Psychology blog was created to help kind of share the science of sex and love and relationships in a way that's informative and engaging and accessible. So it's not really like um, a lot of the other sexual advice websites, which are run by self-proclaimed experts who base their information largely upon kind of their own experiences and beliefs. So his blog is not a personal opinion-based blog, but rather each article is rooted in science and cites or links um, to original research sources. So it's really to help um, readers learn and kind of just get responsible, uh, credible information about sex and relationships and to kind of correct some of the myths and misconceptions uh, around our sexual health and well-being. All right. Well, welcome, Justin. Thank you so much for being here. I know you've talked so much like all weekend (laughs) about this stuff. So I really appreciate you coming and um, sharing all this information with listeners of the podcast. Thanks for having me, Taylor. And my voice is a little weak, but it's still here. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, hanging in there. Um, So I definitely want to talk a little bit about the book that you have now, Tell Me What You Want, and some of the content that we went over in the workshops, um, and then also kind of some listener questions. But uh, first, I was wondering if you could touch a little bit... (laughs) You mentioned some of the research that you're working on now um, that I just found so interesting. And I was like, we should definitely touch on this briefly before we get into like fantasy. Um, so you're, in addition to all the other things that you're working on and that you've done, um, you're doing some research on dick pics, long-term friends with benefits. Um, and those are just two topics that I think are fantastic to be studying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I would describe myself as a promiscuous researcher in mm-hmm. the sense that I can't focus on just one topic. Yeah. You know, the way most academics go is they study one thing for their entire career mm-hmm. at an increasingly narrow focus, and mm-hmm. I just can't do that. So I'm kind of yeah. all over the board with what I study. Mm-hmm. I, I love that, and I'm like, it really takes some you know courage to be like, yeah, I'm going to study dick pics. <laughs> <laughs> And to specifically study the kind where men are sending them Mm non-consensually, where they're not asking a partner first, do you want to see this? Yeah. Or where they're not waiting for somebody else to ask for it. Mm -hmm. They're just putting it out there. So I wanted to look at what's the psychology behind that. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Where does that come from? Yeah. And honestly, I think these are like very important things to study and to actually have some kind of like substantial data around because 
They are so prevalent within our personal lives, um, you know, friends with benefits and all these things that within relationships we, you know, care so much about and they can have such an impact on our mental health. And um, it's, I don't necessarily think, a popular thing to research. No, and sex research in general is, there. there's a lot of resistance to it Mm -hmm. and it's hard to get funding to do it. So that's part of the reason we don't have a lot of people who go into the field. And Mm -hmm. when you look at our conferences, you know, it's a relatively small number of people who who are out there studying sex because you do open yourself up to some risks by Mm -hmm. being involved in this field. I also know a lot of people who are sex researchers and therapists who they're even hesitant to tell their family what it is that they actually do. So I actually wrote a blog post recently on how do you come out as a sex Mm -hmm. researcher or therapist? (laughs) And, you know, it's a challenging thing for people. Yeah. Wow. So all this is so fascinating to me. So how did you get into all of this? Like what's kind of your background that drew you into this field? And I'm like, it's always something I've been interested in. Mm -hmm. I'm not a... I'm really not good at math and statistics. So research is not for me, but I love this topic so much. Um, so yeah, I'm curious what, what got you down this path to where you're at now. So for me, I kind of got into it accidentally. I just stumbled mm-hmm. into it. It wasn't a, a lifelong plan. Yeah. When people used to ask me this question, I would say, well, no one ever says, you know, from the time they're like 10 years old that they want to mm-hmm. be a sex researcher or a therapist. But it turns out I'm wrong on that because <laughs> I've met some people recently who are like, I knew when I was in the fifth grade that I wanted to be a sex wow. therapist. And I'm like, wow, like I, I did not even know this, that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so for me... I came from a somewhat conservative upbringing, Mm -hmm. Um, grew up in a smallish city in Ohio. Mm -hmm. I went to Catholic schools for my undergraduate and master's degree. And so sex research wasn't really a thing I was ever exposed to. There there was no human sexuality Mm -hmm. course on my college campus. And it wasn't until I got to grad school that I was assigned to be a teaching assistant for a human sexuality course Mm -hmm. that that opened up my eyes to the whole world of sex research. Mm -hmm. And in the process of being a teaching assistant, students would start asking me all these questions about sex that I didn't know the answers to. So I had to go and find them out on my own. (laughs) And I just realized how little all of us know about sex. And that's really kind of what made me want to go into this field was to ask Mm -hmm. those questions and answer the questions that so many people have that Mm -hmm. they just need to know the information. Yeah. And too, that, I mean, are are kind of scary questions to ask in the first place. Yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, that's amazing that that the students were bringing this to you in the first place because I think sex often is something that people steer away from talking about and feel like it's something that should be kept private. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, I think that just causes a whole host of other issues (laughs) that then we end up researching. (laughs) It's funny when people find out what I do because they they suddenly assume that, oh, here's somebody I can finally ask Mm -hmm. these questions to that I've never had a chance to do it before. And so I have people who pull me aside all the time Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. bars, at parties, I bet. asking me their deepest questions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's too much information, mm-hmm. you know, like where it's somebody I've known for a long time who's like, I'm in a sexless relationship and how yeah. do I fix this? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I really feel for these people and, yeah. and I'm sorry that they don't have other sources that, mm-hmm. and they don't even feel like they can talk about these issues with their partners. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. My heart's feeling for those people. And some of those people, um, have, wrote questions in, um, and we'll kind of get to answering some of that stuff too. So I want to take a short little break here, um, share a resource that I think will be very helpful for some of you listening. Um, if you have not heard me talk about it before, um, BetterHelp is a online service that will help you connect with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. Um, anything that you share there is com- is confidential and it's also really convenient. So for those of you that just feel like you have a really busy on the go lifestyle and you want to make time to, um, you know, check in with yourself and and seek help with counseling, but don't have the time or the money. Um, Better help is a truly affordable option. And right now, um, for let's talk about it, listeners, you can get ten percent off of your first month with discount code Taylor. So honestly, why not just start today? Um, you guys can go to BetterHelp.com/Taylor and simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs, and then you get matched with a counselor that you'll love. Um, again, that's BetterHelp.com/Taylor. And now we can get back to the show. 
Um, but so I, I want to get a little bit into uh, the research that you did in the book, um, which was the largest survey of sexual fantasies done in America and talks a lot about what your sexual des- desires say about you and kind of how to go about exploring that um, within yourself and with your partner. Um, and so if you can maybe touch a little bit, again, like I said, I'm very bad at statistics, <laughs> um, but if you could just do like a little bit of a brief summary to kind of let people know um, kind of where this data was coming from and kind of how you um, went about collecting it and from who so that then we can kind of get into what some of the actual data said and talk about these fantasies that people are having. Sure. So I surveyed 4,175 Americans. They came from all 50 states. They ranged in age from 18 to 87 and they represent diverse genders, sexual orientations, uh, racial identities, political backgrounds. So it's a, it's a diverse group of people, and mm-hmm. they completed this massive survey that consisted of 369 questions where I asked them about their deepest sexual fantasies mm-hmm. and then their personalities, sexual histories, and demographics so that I could look at how all of those factors are connected to yeah. what it is that we fantasize about. Yeah. I would just like to say I would have loved to have participated in that study. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Um, and you did this all online, correct? Yes. Yeah. Participants all came from the internet uh, because it's it's hard to recruit people otherwise mm-hmm. for, for sex studies. Yeah. And I think with the internet, you can provide people some anonymity that mm-hmm. allows them to open up about maybe what it is that they're fantasizing about that they're afraid to tell anyone. Yeah. But they'll tell a stranger over the internet. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. (laughs) Um, And one thing that I noticed kind of as I was sharing um, some of the content of the workshop on social media was that a lot of people were kind of jumping around when talking about fantasy. Um, And curious if you can kind of differentiate between fantasy, desire, and actual behavior. Um, for me, they all seem like very distinct, different things. But I think people, when when you hear, oh, this is my fantasy, people automatically think, oh, well, this person's doing that, and that's not good, and that's bad. Right. I think those are really important distinctions to make. So a sexual fantasy is just a mental image, mental picture that turns you on. Mm-hmm. It could be a sexual desire, right? A sexual desire is something you want to do. Sometimes our fantasies represent things that we actually want to make a part of our sex life. But sometimes a fantasy is just a fantasy. It's Mm -hmm. just a thought that turns us on and it's not necessarily something we want to do. And then sexual behavior is something that could be based in a fantasy. So maybe it's something you've thought about for a long time that turns you on. Maybe it it's based in a desire, something that you really mm-hmm. wanted to do, but you can also engage in behaviors that you've never fantasized about before and never desired before, right? Yeah. So fantasy, desire, behavior, these are all distinct concepts, mm-hmm. but they are all related in a way too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think, such an important distinction to make, especially when we start talking about um, what these you know, seven most common fantasies are, um, especially because I think they can be somewhat emotionally triggering for people. And I think... I don't really know that I had a specific thought or idea as to what these top fantasies would have even been. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I did think, oh, threesome, yeah, that's probably on there. Um, And I'm curious for for listeners if you can maybe take a second to to consider kind of what your, you know, maybe top three fantasies are that that you think about that turn you on. Um, And I don't know if you know, if you remember all all seven off the top of your head in order. (laughs) I think I can get pretty close. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so there were three types of fantasies that almost everybody reported having. Mm-hmm. One of them was multi-partner sex, mm-hmm. which could be anything from a threesome to an orgy. The second was BDSM, mm-hmm. ranging from mild to wild, but basically any form of power play in the mm-hmm. bedroom or rough sex or, or things along those lines. And then the other big one was novelty, adventure, and variety. Mm-hmm. So just mixing up your sexual routine, doing something that's different for you, like having sex in a new position or in a new setting. Mm -hmm. So those were the three things that almost everyone fantasized about. Beyond that, there were four other things that a lot of people had too. So Mm -hmm. taboo fantasies were really popular, just Mm -hmm. doing something that was socially or culturally forbidden. Having sex in a car. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Public sex is is a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, also, passion and romance fantasies, so where you're trying to meet some deeper emotional need or, yeah. or trying to connect with another person intimately. Which, that one actually, I remember I had someone message and say that that was sad, that that was some people's fantasies. And I think implying that it's a lack of something that they're not having in their life, but I actually think that that can be like a beautiful thing to think about and can be really fulfilling to have that 
passion and romance and um, fantasy of connection. Right. And I think that oftentimes there's some deeper emotional need we're trying to meet through our fantasies. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't think that that's, it's, a, it's not a bad thing. It's not yeah. a sad thing. It's just fantasies are ways that we fulfill multiple functions in our lives. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's to turn us on. Sometimes it's to meet a deeper need to feel more confident or, or secure in ourselves. It's also a way that we plan out future sexual mm-hmm. encounters. You know, fantasies yeah. serve a lot of functions for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, um, maybe some people too were surprised that passion, romance, and intimacy wasn't higher up on mm-hmm. the list of fantasies that yep. people are most commonly having. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I guess it, it kind of made sense to me. And, I don't know. you know, I think when we're talking about these fantasies and these different themes, it's kind of hard to separate them all out mm-hmm. as, as independent categories. So for example, when you think about a group sex fantasy, people tend to just focus on the activity there, but there's often this emotional subtext to it that we don't think about. Yeah. And the subtext there is often just wanting to feel wanted and desired. Mm-hmm. So if you look at people's yeah. threesome fantasies, they usually want to be the center of attention. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of this overwhelming sense of I'm being desired and wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so there is that emotional need that's being met there. Yeah. That's It's not so obvious, but it's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I feel like a lot of the different fantasies can all kind of play into each other and like you can have a fantasy that literally incorporates like all seven of these fantasies. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and people are very creative. <laughs> yes, yes. I am um, I only recently had discovered the world of Tumblr very briefly before it went to shit. Um and yeah, it really opened my eyes to so much and it's not it's not a topic that we've gone into a ton on the podcast, but I know it is one that people want to see talked about more because it helps make them feel more comfortable talking about it and it helps provide other education. So it's time for a short little break here um, with one of my favorite sponsors of the podcast, Away. Um, If you guys didn't hear me, I think it was last week or the week before, um, Canada Man had my adorable little carry-on bag from Away, and I finally have it back, and it's honestly my favorite bag. Um, It's incredibly durable. I can fit so much in there, and it still feels lightweight, Um, and it's also just like very aesthetically pleasing. Um, I love the color of it. It also has the ability to actually charge cell phones and tablets. Um, So when I'm traveling, I don't have to worry about my phone dying because I can just charge my phone in like different five different times with like a single charge on this um, away carry on. Um, And honestly, they have a super great policy. You can have an 100 day trial. You can live with it, vibe with it, travel with it, Instagram it. If at any point you decide it's not for you, you get a full refund with no questions asked. So right now, uh, for Let's Talk About It listeners, you can get $20 off of a suitcase. Visit awaytravel.com slash Taylor and use promo code Taylor2019 during checkout. Again, guys, that's $20 off a suitcase. Visit awaytravel.com slash Taylor and use promo code Taylor2019 during checkout. And enjoy your bag, guys, and hope you have a fun trip planned to go use it on. Um, But with that shared, uh, we can now kind of get back to the show. Um, But yeah, Tumblr introduced me to all kinds of things. (laughs) And it's, it's sad that it's lost in a way mm-hmm. because it, it, it was sort of an archive or history yeah. of, you know, people's sexual wants and desires. Mm-hmm. And so as a, you know, as a scientist, I'm thinking about this as like, <laughs> like this data. is a data source <laughs> that's, that's lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also used Tumblr before in some of our previous research to recruit mm-hmm. participants because you could find people who had very specific interests yes. and then you could sample from that community. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a loss for, for research purposes as well. Yeah. Oh, it's so sad. Um, and for anyone that's listening that doesn't know what happened to Tumblr, um, they basically they got bought out by a larger person or someone else that kind of took over the company and um, essentially scammed through and got rid of a lot of the pornographic content. Um, but then what I found was like very upsetting when I went back to it afterwards. There is still some stuff that like hasn't gotten taken down, but it's like it's the stuff that's very. Um, 
it's it's always the like this is a big black cock and a small you know white blonde girl and look at her taking this huge penis and it's like really like this is the stuff that we're going to keep on that like perpetuate that perpetuate these like you know racial stereotypes and all this and I'm like no that's not <laughs> I'm like where's the artsy like cute indie porn like give me that back <laughs> um, but to get back to the fantasies a little bit. Um, one that I definitely want us to focus on here uh, was the forced sex fantasy. And that was the second most common and in, in included in the rough sex and the power and, and control and this kind of um, this layer of BDSM, which I'm assuming maybe within the time of your research um, that really spiked a lot when things like Fifty Shades of Grey came out that really popularized that kind of fantasy. Yeah, so I collected my data between 2014 and 2016. Fifty Shades was out Mm -hmm. and was popular. And I think it really tapped into a deep sexual desire that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. Uh, In my data, I find that a majority of both men and women fantasize about forced sex, Mm -hmm. specifically in the form of somebody else is forcing you Mm -hmm. to have sex. Now, when I say forced, it's not truly forced in the sense that in these fantasies, it's consensual, Mm -hmm. right? Um, There's also another type of forced sex fantasy where people are fantasizing about forcing sex on somebody else. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a different thing and that's that's less common. Yeah. Um, But a majority of people report fantasies about somebody forcing sex on them in a way. Mm -hmm. And and I think it speaks to the fact that a lot of us have desires for sexual submission. And Mm -hmm. this is one way that we sort of play that out. Yeah. I am. I did jot down these, this data point, um, not going to remember it off the top of my head, but did think it was very fascinating, um, that in your data, 61% of women had fantasized about forced sex, um, and 24% of them fantasized often about it. Um, and then men, uh, 54% had fantasized about it and 11.5% fantasized about it often. Um, and then even the nine non-binary participants, um, fantasized about it 68% of the time, um, which is just much larger than I would have anticipated. Right. Um, and I think one of the things I super appreciated about, um, your workshop and kind of how you presented this data was to also bring up the conversation around, forced sex being one of the most common fantasies, but then also within this new movement that we have in this era of Me Too and how different that can make women feel and kind of how even that dynamic shifts a little bit. Um, When I did share this on social media, there were a lot of kind of conflicting reactions to this, um, that it creeps me out, that it justifies and glorifies rape, um, that porn sends the wrong message about this, that you're pretty much saying rape is okay. Um, And then a lot of people really kind of like struggling with the idea of like, this is a fantasy I have and, you know, I consider myself a feminist or um, I think I need therapy about this because this feels really wrong, um, that this is only okay when trust exists um, and all kinds of uh, just messages all over the board with this. Yeah, it's a such a complex topic, and it's something that I've increasingly heard people talking about where people have the fantasy of forced sex, but they also want to be strong supporters of, of people who have been sexually victimized. Mm-hmm. And so there are some people who feel like they're hypocrites or traitors mm-hmm. to the Me Too cause by mm-hmm. fantasizing about forced sex. So I get that there's this cognitive inconsistency on some level for mm-hmm. some people that makes them feel really uncomfortable. But I think the way that we need to to think about this to move forward is to separate this fantasy of, of forced sex from the reality of sexual assault because those are two mm-hmm. very, very different things. Yeah. In the fantasy of forced sex, this is consensual. When mm-hmm. you're fantasizing about it, you're setting the terms. You dictate who your partner is. You dictate all of the terms under which this takes place and how it Mm -hmm. unfolds. And so you have that control. So it Mm -hmm. bears no resemblance to a real life sexual assault where somebody does not have that control or Mm -hmm. power to, to, um, set the terms of that Mm -hmm. encounter. Yeah. 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 And I think it's, I I love that, that distinction. And I think, that is where we need to move away maybe from even considering this a rape fantasy. Um, and I think when you when you call it a rape fantasy, it puts out all kinds of um, 
ideas and um, factors at which the person really might actually not want. Um, and when you actually define that fantasy of forced sex, it really is not rape. It, it, it is consensual, like you're saying. And um, the person who is being submissive does actually have some control and say in all the things that they want and with who and when and where and how and all of those things. Um, some people asked uh, regarding this specific fantasy, um, if uh, if with with them struggling with this, um, are their sexual fantasies an extension of their real life feelings um, that in real life they might actually want to be submissive or taken in this way? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is this. Sorry, can we back up one second? Yeah. Um, so the question is specifically about... Yeah, she asked, are sexual fantasies an extension of my real life feelings? I have a lot of fantasies involving being dominated, which feels at odds with my feminist ideals. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm just sorry, just trying to figure out how to answer that because I wasn't sure if she was talking about your previous sexual experiences like with victimization and whether that was related mm. to the fantasies. But I guess I, I, I don't yeah. want to go into that if that's not what no, you're asking no, 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 about. No, okay. no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just kind of like, you know, I in in real life I consider myself a feminist mm-hmm. and, you know, I, I have these ideals around wanting to be a, you know, strong, independent woman, all of this, but then I also have this fantasy of being very submissive and being taken and having forced sex. So is that fantasy actually an extension of like my real life feelings and how I actually feel about myself or other women? <sighs> Yeah, I think we're all psychologically complex Mm -hmm. and we have different identities, different sets of values. And and sometimes what we want sexually is different from seemingly Mm -hmm. what our stated values are. And and so I I think that's where some of this tension comes in is that we're perceiving Mm -hmm. this conflict between what we're valuing in terms of, say, equality Mm -hmm. and then in terms of a desire for us to, say, give up power Mm -hmm. in the bedroom or to to have more power in the bedroom, right? So it can go in different directions there. Playing with power in bed is is a taboo, right? Mm -hmm. But it's something that's very appealing to a lot of people Mm -hmm. and... You can be turned on by power play, and that does not make you a bad feminist, yeah. right? Uh, those are different things, and mm-hmm. you can be both of those at the same time. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I think that can be difficult maybe to come to terms with because I think especially um, when you are a feminist or when you want to be a feminist, you can be so hard on yourself and have so much pressure um, to be like the perfect feminist, you Mm -hmm. know? Uh, But I think it is okay to hold these two conflicting things at the same time. Um, One question that I received around this for sex was, how can you balance enthusiastic consent with this fantasy? Um, I thought that was a great question. (laughs) Yeah, and and that's such an interesting point is... Mm -hmm we've been having all these conversations recently about what consent Mm -hmm. should be when it comes to sex. And a lot of people say it, we need to follow these affirmative consent policies where Mm -hmm. consent is, is enthusiastic and very overt, but in the way that people often fantasize about sex, Mm -hmm. uh, that's not part of the scenario. I don't usually fantasize about a guy asking if he can kiss me. He's just kissing me. Right. Mm -hmm. And When you look at these policies that are being enacted, like in states like California, where they've got these Mm -hmm. affirmative consent policies that are supposed to govern how consent Mm -hmm. happens on college campuses, that's what the policy says. But if you look at the reality of how people communicate consent, Mm -hmm. it doesn't match up with it. Because most people communicate through nonverbal means Mm -hmm. and you don't have those overt signals. And so, you know, on the one hand, we've got this idea that, you know, the ideal of consent is that it's obvious Mm -hmm. and and totally clear. But on the other hand, that's just not reflective of the reality of the way people approach Mm -hmm. sex. And so we have to find a way to to balance that. Yeah. And I think especially when it comes to like a forced sex fantasy, um, I feel like people can kind of take measures prior to actually engaging in that sexual act. Um, part of what you talk about in the book and even in the workshop are, are these different steps to how you go about sharing your fantasy with your partner, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but I think to have that forced sex fantasy, if you want to take that step from fantasy to desire to behavior um, of maybe like initiating that conversation ahead of time to have that enthusiastic consent so that 
your partner or the guy maybe you're loosely dating knows that that is something that you're interested in. And so when they want to pick up the ball on that, that like that they have the green light. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think even then it can be difficult to like know if it's the right time for them. And, you know, I'm sure men even then have this fear of even initiating these forced sex fantasies now. Sure. And, and this is where I think people can learn a lot from the BDSM and kink communities in terms of how they communicate consent. Mm -hmm. And for them, consent is, is sacred and it's communicated very extensively in advance. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they have negotiation checklists that are longer than a CVS receipt, you know, (laughs) that that say everything that is and is not okay. Mm -hmm. And, And so they've laid that all out in advance. And so then you don't need to as the act unfolds, like yeah. keep saying, is this okay? Is this okay? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so by setting all of that out in the beginning and then having a safe mm-hmm. word, right, mm-hmm. that allows this opportunity for things to unfold a little more naturally. Yeah. And I think I actually came across that um, blog post um, on your sex and psychology blog. You can literally search. You remind me how many times you write blogs a week. It's, <laughs> it's been three <laughs> times a week for like eight years now. Every that week. Is- <laughs> So many. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, thankfully you have this like little search button. And um, I think I typed in, uh, what did I type in last night? I don't even remember. I think it was maybe something around consent, I guess, or forced sex to kind of prep for some of the things I want to talk about today. And I think I came across that article. Um, so if you guys do have any kinds of questions about any of these other things, we got three articles per week for the last eight years. So I'm sure you'll be able to find whatever you're looking for. <laughs> I try to cover everything. <laughs> yes. Um, but no, I think that's a, a fantastic tool to kind of look at the BDSM community in terms of how they communicate consent um, as to how you can in this kind of fantasy. And it's it's unfortunate that I think even just people taking the time and having the courage to even initiate or to even have this kind of conversation in the first place um, can be really tough. So um, maybe we should move a little bit into how we kind of communicate this fantasy with our partners, um, you listed a few icebreakers that I thought were really helpful. Um, and one of them that I really liked was the, um, the Erica Lust X Confessions app, um, which I downloaded last night and, uh, my partner is not in the same city as me right now. So I was like, I'll wait until he gets here and then we can (laughs) kind of download it together and go through it. Um, But using that as like a tool and even things like um, going to a sex shop or watching a steamy movie together, which I think the, the movie piece even, I think could be a very easy one to have happen. Yeah, there's so many ways that you can get a conversation going mm-hmm. and, and you kind of just have to figure out what's right for you and your partner based on your comfort level. Mm-hmm. So so for some people, it could just be try and use popular media to, to start a conversation about sex when mm-hmm. there's a sexy scene that pops up in a movie that you're watching or if you read some erotic fiction together or, or some book, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you can have your own little book club with your partner, right? Yeah. And you can go out and read uh, some erotic fiction or something and then come back mm-hmm. and, and talk about it afterwards. Um, also that X confessions app you mentioned is sort of like the Tinder for sex fantasies. And so you just swipe right on the fantasies Mm -hmm. that are of interest to you, swipe left on the ones you're not into. And then it just provides a match, uh, Mm -hmm. and tells you and your partner where you have things in common. And it doesn't reveal the things that you are interested in, but your partner isn't. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a safe way of revealing fantasies Mm -hmm. because you don't have to share those that your partner isn't into. Which I love because I think a lot of what people are scared about and even sharing their fantasies is that my partner's not going to be into this and then yeah. I'm going to look like really weird or they're not going to like me anymore. Um, and even regarding this uh, notion of, of um, communicating our fantasies to our partners, got a few other questions around this topic um, of how would you recommend wading through a significant other's fantasy that you are not up for? Mm-hmm. So here's the thing. If you're really not into it at all, Mm -hmm. don't force yourself to do something you don't want to do. That's not something that, Mm -hmm. that I would recommend. 
if you're open to it, but it's just not, you know, necessarily one of your biggest fantasies, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there can be some of that give and take in the relationship where it's like, okay, you know, this isn't my favorite thing, but I want to see you happy. And so Mm -hmm. let's, let's work on this for you, but I want to do this. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so when there's that give and take, when it's reciprocal, we see that that's actually good for relationships where you Mm -hmm. take turns prioritizing each other's pleasure and that willingness to put someone else's needs ahead of yours Mm -hmm. from time to time is is one of the signs of a happy healthy relationship so again don't do anything you really don't want to do that makes you uncomfortable but Mm -hmm. taking turns prioritizing each other is is healthy yeah yeah i i agree with that um would you recommend someone kind of sitting with it and figuring out what it is about that fantasy that makes them not interested or what their boundaries are that makes this a fantasy that they're not interested in and communicating that that could potentially be useful but another thing that you might consider is all right is there another way that we could try and act out this Mm -hmm. fantasy that would be better for for me yeah Mm -hmm. um because there are all kinds of routes and paths you can take when it comes to acting out a fantasy whether it's you just watch porn that features that theme or you do some Mm -hmm. role playing or you know if it's a threesome or something you know bringing somebody Mm -hmm. into your bed like there are all different kinds of ways you can go to fulfill a fantasy and it's just find a method that you're both Mm -hmm. comfortable with yeah like if your partner says i want to have a threesome and you're like no i'm not so i'm not down for that maybe you can have like a sexed uh story of having a threesome and engaging in that but not perhaps like actually seeking steps to go and do that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, you, you can, you can take baby steps to yeah. it. Um, and maybe you never get to the point where you have a threesome and that's fine. Mm-hmm. It's just, you do what it is that you're comfortable with along the way. So some yeah. people, for example, might do kind of like a long distance threesome mm-hmm. where it's like the two of them together and they, they sort of do some, some phone sex mm-hmm. with somebody else on the other end or cyber yeah. sex. Right. So mm-hmm. that way you're, you're kind of bringing somebody else in, mm-hmm. but there's, you don't have any of the physical health risks or anything like that. Yeah. And you know, it can be very time limited mm-hmm. and so forth. So there are all kinds of ways to enact a fantasy. Yeah. Huh. I never thought about that one before. Um, Someone also asked, is it normal to not have any sexual fantasies? So there are some people who just don't have fantasies. Mm -hmm. I I find in my data and in other data on fantasies that it's about 2 to 3% of people who say, I don't have sexual fantasies. And we don't know you know, why it is that some people don't have them, but Mm. we do know that there are some people who just, they have this inability to voluntarily visualize imagery, right? So Mm. they just can't create a mental Mm -hmm. picture. And so for those people who don't have sexual fantasies, it might just be that they Mm. can't create those mental pictures. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I find at least for myself and maybe what I imagine most people kind of use fantasies for and and we we went over this in the workshop too all the different purposes that fantasies can serve us and for me i think a large part of it is like kind of that escape a little bit of like okay this seems much more nice to think about right now. <laughs> like, I remember I think I said this on an episode a while back of like, if I'm struggling to go to sleep, like, yeah, sometimes I'll just start thinking about different like sexual uh, encounters or situations. And that's just like a light, positive thing to think about that's like not going to stress me out when I'm trying to go to sleep. And I'm like thinking about emails I haven't responded to and all of that. Um, so that, that's, that's interesting that... Um, I was thinking, like, no, yeah, you probably do have sexual fantasies. So you just can't think of what they are. But I guess some people legitimately just might not have any. Yeah, some people just don't seem to have them. But other people, they, they just might not categorize or think of yeah. their fantasies as sexual fantasies. So, for example, yes. if someone's fantasy is more about romance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe they don't necessarily categorize that as a sex fantasy because it's more about emotions than it is about Mm -hmm. sex, right? So Mm -hmm. it kind of depends on your own personal definition to some degree. Yeah. Huh. Um, Our next question is uh, a little tricky. Um, (laughs) She says, I was sexually assaulted by a male a year ago and now I dream about dating girls. Mm. Is something wrong with me? So... I've seen something in my data that reflects this person's experience. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I saw in my data was that for 
um, women who identified as exclusively lesbian, uh, mm-hmm. who had fantasies about men, there was a link with having been sexually victimized before. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so I think for some people, their sexual identity label and uh, sexual attractions to some degree are a way of distancing themselves Mm -hmm. from a previous trauma, you know, something that they were uncomfortable with. So, Mm -hmm. so I think in, in my data, I see some women who are probably bisexual to begin with, Mm -hmm. who are now identifying as lesbian because it's a way of disidentifying Mm -hmm. with their attraction to men uh, and and their attraction specifically to someone who has victimized them. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's, there's all these complex links between victimization and then how we feel about ourselves, how we identify what turns us on. And I think if this is something that you're really struggling with, speaking to a counselor or therapist mm-hmm. is, is a really good idea for trying to work through that yeah, trauma. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It, it, it makes a lot of sense um, to kind of have that distance and a little bit of that disassociation um, with something that maybe feels more safe or feels um, a little bit more connecting uh, after that kind of experience. Yeah. And, and we see this a lot in the data where people who are victims of sexual assault, they use their fantasy as a way to create comfort or reassurance mm. in a way, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's our fantasies are therapeutic in terms of helping us to deal with different traumas and other things that we've experienced. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another, there were a lot of questions, (laughs) but they were all, I thought, very interesting. Um, Someone asked, what if any fantasies are off limits or too much? Does consent make absolutely any sexual fantasy okay or are some things never okay? There was only one thing that came to mind, two things that came to mind for me, but I'm curious what you would say. (laughs) So I think first what I would say is that it's normal in the sense of being common to have a really dark deviant fantasy on occasion, right? Most people in my data and in other research I've seen will have some very dark fantasies. Mm -hmm. Now, if that becomes your your favorite fantasy of all time, where it is Mm -hmm. a non-consensual act and where there's this serious risk of harm to someone else, if that becomes your favorite fantasy, that's a potential problem, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Especially if you're concerned that you might act on that fantasy in the Mm -hmm. future, right? In that case, that's where you would want to go seek professional help. But just having the fantasy, especially on sort of a one-off basis, Mm -hmm. is not necessarily something to to worry about or to, you know, Mm. start thinking there's something inherently wrong with you. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, the, The two things that came to mind for me on this that I was like, yeah, I would say these both of these things are never okay, regardless of consent, and that even consent in these types of fantasies don't actually count as consent would be um, with pedophilia and with uh, zoophilia. Mm-hmm. And, and those are the two fantasies that really are statistically rare mm-hmm. in the sense that very few people are fantasizing about them and yeah. fantasizing about them frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there is that concern about consent there yeah. and and if this is a, a favorite fantasy of yours and it's something you think you might act mm-hmm. on that's that's where it's time to yeah. seek help yeah and i think perhaps even when people start thinking of um a question like this of which fantasies would be off limits and if you're having consent like does that just make everything okay i think even kind of in more the extreme bdsm scenarios um of really laying out what that consent looks like ahead of time um can, can help make things maybe feel more okay. Um, one thing that I learned from your workshop that I thought was really fascinating and made a lot of sense, but I had never like explicitly learned or um, thought of prior was our disgust response in terms of our sexual fantasies and being engaged in sexual acts that when we're doing, when we're sexually aroused, our disgust uh, response is lowered um, to where then you might you know, be more interested in something that afterwards you'd be like, oh, no. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I was like, oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> like that makes makes a lot of sense. And and I think it will make a lot of sense to a lot of people when they think about, say, their masturbation habits, mm-hmm. right? A lot of people use porn as an accompaniment mm-hmm. to masturbation, but a lot of people, once they reach orgasm, as mm-hmm. soon as that happens, they can't close out the tabs on their browser quickly enough mm-hmm. or you know close the lid on their laptop quickly enough because that disgust response is coming mm-hmm. flooding back. Yeah. And uh, you know that's also why a lot of people, when they have partnered sex, once they have an orgasm, it's like, ah, I'm done. You mm-hmm. know, it's just because that yeah. disgust response comes right back. Yeah. 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 That's, <laughs> it's really funny to think about actually. <laughs> Um, but, but it's really interesting because when that disgust response is lower, when you're sexually mm-hmm. aroused, that opens the door to you trying things that you might never otherwise think yes. about doing. And so that helps yeah. us to understand, for example, where certain fetishes might might mm-hmm. come from is because that disgust response is lower. And maybe for some people, it lowers much more than others, right? Mm. And so that just opens the door to, to trying new things. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, it's. I think it can be helpful to be aware of that notion because I think it can maybe help reduce some kind of guilt or shame that people might start to feel um, regarding the things that turn them on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was someone asked, uh, if you've been a straight woman for your entire life, is it abnormal to fantasize about la- about lesbian sex? Um, yes. Not. I mean, not abnormal. That yes, it's normal. It is absolutely normal. Yeah. Uh, and if, if my data are any guide, that's actually, that, that's really common. Mm-hmm. So I find in my data that it's, I think it was 58% of women who identified mm-hmm. as exclusively heterosexual said that they had had same sex fantasies. Mm-hmm. So that's a majority. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that tells us that this is a normal experience in the sense of being really mm-hmm. common. Yeah. And it was, I think it's, um, we can find a lot of things like biologically, evolutionarily that we talked a little bit about in the workshop that, um, again, make this make sense. Um, where, where women are a little bit more gender fluid, um, mm-hmm. and perhaps sexually fluid, uh, than men are. Um, and I am blanking now, but I want to say one of the things that we talked about that kind of could attribute to that would be, um, the notion that you know if a when a woman's husband or partner or whatever is away or like back in the day you know if they were to die or whatever that then the woman would have to seek comfort within the other women in the community mm-hmm. um to survive yeah, so that's something called the alloparenting hypothesis, mm-hmm. and it's an evolutionary theory for why women might have evolved a more flexible or fluid mm-hmm. sexuality. It was a way of them being able to reorient their attractions in mm-hmm. the event that a male partner who was the father of their children died mm-hmm. or disappeared in some way. Um, we also see that in general, if you look at women's genital response patterns when they're shown different types of yes. porn. This was so interesting. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, so if you look at heterosexual women, and you show them heterosexual porn, lesbian porn, and gay male porn, and you look at what's happening to them Mm -hmm. genitally, you see that they're showing arousal in response to all of that pornography. Um, By contrast... By contrast (laughs) for men, um, they're only showing arousal to porn that features targets of their desired Mm -hmm. sex. So straight men only show arousal to porn featuring women. Gay men only show arousal to porn featuring men. So it's really women and especially these heterosexual women who are showing this, what we call non-specific genital Mm -hmm. response pattern. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but, um, wasn't that also, wasn't, wasn't it also thought to be that, um, this would be the case because, Biologically, women, uh, you know, would be open to receiving sperm and all kinds of different, uh, options for reproductive, for like reproduction purposes. Is that right? And that men are more like focused directly on, maybe I'm getting this backwards. I'm thinking of like sperm competition, but in the notion of like women being open and needing to like, get stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we talked about a lot of different things this weekend. Yeah, um, I, we did. I, I don't know that the, the sperm competition part is is like a key part of explaining why this particular mm-hmm. thing happens. Um, something we did briefly mention though was that in terms of why women might have this non-specific genital response pattern, mm-hmm. another evolutionary way of thinking about it is that women historically have had less social power 
mm-hmm. than men have. And so mm-hmm. as a result, women have disproportionately been the targets of sexual victimization. Mm-hmm. And so one of the theories is that women's bodies evolved to be more responsive to mm-hmm. various sexual cues in order to prepare the body for a potential sexual assault because that would reduce mm-hmm. injury that, that might potentially happen there. It's yes. something called the, the preparation hypothesis. And, mm-hmm. and this is something that's really interesting to think about when you're thinking about victims of sexual assault because mm-hmm. there are many women who have been raped who report that they had an orgasm mm-hmm. uh, when that experience happened or they experienced vaginal lubrication and then they feel all this guilt and shame mm-hmm. because it makes them feel like, well, Did Did I I want want that? that? Right. Mm -hmm. So in reality, what might be happening is that it's just your body trying to protect you, Mm -hmm. right? And it's not because you wanted that to happen, right? So there's, there can be this disconnect in women between what your body does and what your brain wants Mm -hmm. to happen, right? Yes. I I do remember that. And, um, it's a amazing kind of how our bodies can do that. But I think it can also be really difficult to feeling like, I'm being turned on by this, but like mentally I'm in no way attracted to this or turned on by it. Um, And having this like conflict between your mind and your body. And and that's something that's really interesting when you look at the genital arousal research with Mm -hmm. women is that, you know, their genital response patterns are saying, I'm turned on by everything. But if you look at women's self-reports, like when they report psychologically, how aroused Mm -hmm. do they feel? Their responses line up with their sexual orientation, right? Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that that disconnect. It's something that uh, psychologists sometimes call uh, Mm -hmm. non-concordance, right? So where the the mind says one thing, the body says something different. Hmm. Hmm. It's wild. (laughs) wild to think about. Um, and I think even too, perhaps maybe in some people's like dark fantasies, maybe it is something that they felt sexually aroused by, but mentally they didn't think turn them on. And so then that could like create them to have a fantasy about it to kind of think through that, mm-hmm. um, which could then make you feel like this is a really dark fantasy. Like, whoa. <laughs> and, and that also goes back to what we talked about earlier about the difference between a fantasy and a, and a mm-hmm. desire too, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes something can turn you on, but you definitely don't want to do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and one thing we briefly kind of started to touch on earlier about porn, um, and a lot of people had questions about how the porn industry affects sexual desires, um, which I'm... There should be a whole other research study <laughs> on that. Because, um, yeah, I would imagine in a lot of ways it kind of has a like cycle effect in a way of um, maybe porn creating some sexual desires and then our sexual desires being fulfilled in porn. Um, one thing I thought was very interesting um, was that you noted that a lot of people often think that when you start watching porn, um, that the more you watch it, the more extreme you're porn is going to become, but that it doesn't. It just is that people need new and different things to watch to turn them on. Right. Yeah. So a lot of people talk about porn as being this drug Mm -hmm. and it creates this tolerance effect where Mm -hmm. you increasingly need more and more over time, uh, more and more extreme content over time Mm -hmm. in order to get aroused or to have an orgasm. And what we see in the data, and this is not my data, this is other Mm -hmm. research that, that scientists have conducted, what that data shows is that people do not gravitate toward more extreme content Mm -hmm. over time. And also, if you look at people who are into more extreme porn, Mm -hmm. they're also turned on by by vanilla porn Mm -hmm. too, right? Uh, Which suggests that it's not something, you know, specific about the extreme Mm -hmm. porn for them. They're just kind of turned on by by everything. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about porn and how it affects us. And there's a lot of people who just want to demonize porn and Mm -hmm. say it's, it's bad and and create all these arguments to to try Mm -hmm. and justify why porn is a public health crisis. But the reality is, you know, what the data say is, is different from a lot Mm -hmm. of what the public rhetoric is about it. Yeah. And then I think too, that people kind of struggle with, you know, being a feminist, but also watching porn to masturbate and, um, you know, wanting to find porn that actually reflects. Um, I know I've talked about this a little bit where it's like, yeah, there aren't really people out there that I see myself in online when it comes to porn. Um, and Tumblr was a great way to get that, <laughs> but not anymore. Um, but where, you know, you, you want this content that feels, um, safe, that feels consensual, that feels like it's actually 
pleasurable and, and, and enjoyable for the people that are in it. Um, and you know, just that confliction again of like being feminist, but also like wanting to masturbate and wanting to explore that and using porn as a tool for that. Um, and I know we've already mentioned Erica Lust and she's a, um, filmmaker and her films are great. Um, and I'm curious if you have any other kind of suggestions. I'm sure you do. And I'm sure if you go on the sex and psychology blog, um, that there is like many lists of that. Um, is there any like one that just jumps out at you that would be good to recommend? Um, I, I can't think of a specific porn producer who, who, you know, might be mm-hmm. making porn that might meet yeah. that need. But I guess what I would say in response to that is that there, there's all kinds of porn that's out there and, yeah. and you can just find a type that I think works well with your value set. Mm-hmm. And I think this is why, for example, a lot of women are drawn to gay male porn, right? Mm. Because there's no woman involved mm-hmm. there. And so they don't have to put themselves psychologically in the... Mm you know, position mm-hmm. of a character in the video. Right. Yeah. Um, Interesting. so, so a lot of women are, are turned on by gay male porn specifically because they, they don't have to, to see themselves in it. They don't have to think mm-hmm. about the role of gender and, yeah. and so forth. Or that it's like degrading in any right. way. Um, what about lesbian porn then? So you do see women who watch, um, you know, all kinds of porn mm-hmm. and, and in lesbian porn, there does tend to be more of that equality. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and, and so I think that's part of the reason why, you know, women, we see them seeking out very diverse mm-hmm. content. It's mm-hmm. because they're, they're trying to find something that yeah. is female friendly mm-hmm. and there's just, you know, most porn, the reality is that it's made by men for yeah. men and it can be hard to find. And also even a lot of the lesbian porn is made for male for eyes. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah. it, it's not necessarily just going to be safer mm-hmm. or more appealing necessarily because it's, you know, yeah. say two women involved. Sometimes you just have to search a lot to find mm-hmm. something that meets your needs. Definitely. Um, and one thing that I know I've gotten asked several times before um, regarding porn and kind of leads us into a little bit of um, maybe some non-monogamy or just cheating dynamics. Um, but people saying is one um one listener specifically said, I caught my husband watching porn after he denied it for years. How do I deal with this? And people thinking, again, kind of this notion that that porn is this really negative thing and that porn is my partner, you know, betraying me. And in this case, he was lying. So, yeah, he, he was lying to you. <laughs> um, but where... Uh, I think there is kind of this pressure when you are in a monogamous relationship, um, meaning that the two of you are exclusively dating each other emotionally, sexually committed to each other, um, that, that they're going to fulfill all of your desires and all of your needs. And that, you know, how dare they Mm -hmm. find someone else attractive or be turned on by someone else or, um, seek that sexual arousal from someone that's not you, Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on this? So th- to go back to that question mm-hmm. that was asked, you know, um, about this, this woman who caught her husband watching porn after mm-hmm. he had denied it. I, th- I think the interesting question there is why are you upset in the first place that he was yeah. watching porn? Right. Mm-hmm. And is that a, a realistic expectation to have yeah. if you're in a relationship with a man to say, you're never going to find somebody else attractive. You're never going to watch porn. Mm-hmm. The reality we see in the my data on sexual fantasies is that most people will have fantasies about someone other than their partner yeah. at some point. And mm-hmm. also most men will watch porn throughout their lives, yeah. right? Uh, so just because you find somebody else attractive mm-hmm. does not necessarily mean that you're going to cheat. It yeah. does not mean that there's mm-hmm. something wrong in your relationship. It's normal for mm-hmm. people to be turned on by sexual variety and yeah. sexual novelty. And that's ultimately what this is all about. Mm-hmm. And so I think ultimately where a lot of this problem stems from is that we've been conditioned to think that everybody has a soulmate out there, this mm-hmm. one perfect person that will meet yes. all of our needs and um, you know that we're going to have everlasting passion with mm-hmm. them. And it turns out that that's really hard <laughs> yes. to find. Yeah. You know, some people seem to find it, but it, it doesn't work out that way for most people. Yeah. And I, I feel like when people have this strong belief in a soulmate that it's it really um, reinforces monogamy as like the right way to have a relationship and that like um, our destiny is in um, monogamy in a way. And one thing I found very interesting was that um, of the people that 
were in your research that uh, that were in monogamous relationships, 71% of them fantasized about being in an open relationship, mm-hmm. um, 60% fantasized about polyamory, 57% of swinging, um, and granted that men were more interested in this than women, but still, those are like really high rates. Yeah. And I think it just really speaks to the fact that monogamy is is really hard mm-hmm. in terms of being able to meet all of our sexual needs. Yeah. Right. Uh, we see that in romantic relationships, the typical time course for passion is, you know, somewhere between a couple of months and a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And most people start to experience a drop in passion after mm-hmm. that. And it's just because of this tendency for us to grow bored with yeah. sexual routines mm-hmm. and it's hard to keep things yeah. exciting yeah. Uh, in the bedroom. And so if you want to make a monogamous relationship work, you can. I'm mm-hmm. not saying monogamy is yeah. impossible. It's just it takes that, a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you have to realize that sustained passion requires effort and mm-hmm. you have to both be willing to work on that. Yeah. Yeah. And some of these questions that I received that were more specific to sex um, really made my heart hurt for some people. Um, People saying that their biggest struggle in their marriage is that they're not interested in anything sexual, that they just want their friends and their life. Um, That how do they get over spouts of really low sex drive? I love my boyfriend, but I just can't seem to get into it. How to work on not thinking about sex as something I have to do for my partner um, and addressing kind of different libidos within partners and what do you do if sex gets boring and and all these things where it's um, it feels like you know these women are in relationships where they feel like they have to provide sex where they're not enjoying their sex um, and where they just overall feel kind of meh about it mm-hmm. um, and who are all in monogamous relationships. Um, and that just made me, made my heart really hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And want to be like, there are a lot of other ways that you can, um, you know, spice things up per se. Um, and I really appreciated that in, in your research and your workshop that you noted that, you know, monogamy is possible, but it is also like, you need to have this focus on your passion in a way and, and, being open-minded to trying new and different things. Um, And you gave a bunch of really great suggestions um, about how to kind of get the sex life you want and how to communicate this with your partner. Um, And I'm curious if you could share a little bit maybe for some of these listeners um, of how to kind of get out of that rut and how to maybe get into it. I've got lots I can share. Just one thing I wanted to mention Mm -hmm. um, since you're talking about all these women who are writing in who are having these problems with desire, we need to talk about the role of gender Mm -hmm. and sexual desire and how it's different in heterosexual relationships for men and women. Mm -hmm. What we see is that women's desire actually drops off faster Mm -hmm. than men's does Mm -hmm. in a relationship, right? Uh, And that's where we see a lot of these sexual desire discrepancies Mm -hmm. popping up where, you know, one partner wants more sex or different sex than the other one. Mm -hmm. So something you have to realize going in is that, you know, you can do everything you think you can do at the beginning to establish sexual compatibility, but that doesn't mean your sex drives are going to stay the same over time and Mm -hmm. your sexual wants are going to stay the same. So you you have to to recognize that issues are going to pop up at one time or another. And the way that we we solve that oftentimes is just by working to introduce novelty into the relationship, Mm -hmm. right? So so trying new and different things. And and one of those things could be sharing your fantasies Mm -hmm. with your partner, right? I find in my data that most people say they want to act on their favorite fantasy of all time, Mm -hmm. but most people are not acting on it, right? So so incorporating those fantasies into your sex life can can be good and it can boost Mm -hmm. desire. Also for women, it can boost orgasms. We see that women who are sharing and acting on their fantasies report having the most consistent in mm-hmm. orgasms, right? Yeah. So that can help us to close the orgasm gap. Yeah. Uh, something else that's also important is to make sure you've got a lot of touch in your relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this is, you know, not necessarily sexual touch, but yeah. just like having that intimate contact with your partner is mm-hmm. so important for feeling emotionally connected. Yeah. And that can lay the basis for sexual activity to occur. So, mm-hmm. so this means like, you know, touching your partner, giving them like yeah. little back rubs here and there. And, and it's not to say mm-hmm. that this goes one direction, you know, that you're both yeah. touching each other. Yes. Um, but then also touching each other after sex is mm-hmm. important too. Couples who spoon more and cuddle after sex mm-hmm. are happier and they have more desire. So having that touch is really crucial. Hmm. 
Um, and, and along that, uh, one of the things that you said was to be more vocal. Yeah. And I really, at first I thought you meant, um, just like communicating, you know, beforehand or like afterwards, like positive reinforcement, but you were like, no, like be loud. Be like, noisy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you know, that's actually a really great point. And I can think back to, you know, many years of, uh, of having sex or, um, receiving oral or giving oral sex and just realizing that like there's it's like kind of silent yeah. sometimes and <laughs> that it, it doesn't feel as connecting or as exciting and i imagine that a lot of these women that are writing in are probably having pretty silent sex too yeah. when you think about it a lot of people are like basically having sex in like a sensory deprivation tank right yeah. where the lights are turned off mm-hmm. and there's no noise and it's just mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah like that may not be the right way to, to approach yeah. sex, right? Mm-hmm. So having sex with the lights on, for one thing, creates visual yeah. stimulation. Yes. And despite all the bullshit we hear about men being more visually aroused than women, it's, it's I'm not very true. very visual. There <laughs> yeah. are like so many times where like my current partner is like wants the lights off because he's like tired and he's like, I've looked at screens all day. I just don't want the lights <laughs> on. And I'm like, no, I want to see you. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that, you know, when we repeat that stereotype that women aren't Mm -hmm. visually aroused, I think that leads women to miss out on this important role of vision in in Mm -hmm. sexual arousal, right? Um, So so that's part. The other part is, you know, being loud and vocal is is a Mm -hmm. way of communicating with your partner, you know, moaning and groaning shows them what you like. Mm -hmm. And then that increases the odds that they're going to do that again in the future. So it creates that positive reinforcement. Uh, There's also other research showing that women who are more vocal in bed that um that their male partners you know that facilitates their orgasm Mm -hmm. right so so men also really enjoy being with a a vocal woman yeah and i think like i know in terms of my own personal reflection it feels like sometimes you don't want to be that like very dramatic you know wild porno girl that's just like screaming all over the place and and you you worry that oh shit like is this what he wants like is this what i'm supposed to do like oh like i don't want to do that um but i'm making sure that that like is very authentic and and almost kind of opening yourself up like maybe literally being mindful and focusing on like your chest and your throat like when you are in some kind of sexual encounter or activity of letting that be open to like express how you're feeling and um yeah i think it it does provide this layer of positive reinforcement and um I'm yeah, I'm just thinking of all of my sexual experiences now and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. This all makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but uh, also when, when people are noisy in bed, like it it shows your partner how much you want them and mm-hmm. how much you're turned on by yeah. them, right? So yep. this this desire to feel wanted is mm-hmm. something that both men and women experience, yeah. right? We want to know that our partners are into us. Yep. And so when people are loud and vocal, that makes it very clear mm-hmm. like I'm into you. Yeah. And that can, I think, help create this Mm -hmm. passionate environment that a lot of us are looking for and don't have. Yeah. And, you know, on the podcast, I am very subjective and I I do get vulnerable and share things. And usually my guest does too. And since you're not, I'm like, okay, (laughs) I feel like I need to share a practical example of this. Um, And this is a safe place, guys. Um, So, yeah, I know, for example, when a guy, my particular partner, really enjoys being deep throated and I'm like oh, my ass can't fucking deep throat like that's just it's too much and it's just like I'm not a porn star um and one of the things that I did communicate was like you know yeah if you give me like positive reinforcement like throughout this like it'll motivate me to like want to go deeper and to like push my limits a little bit and um you know, obviously I communicated that like beforehand and then it was very nice and rewarding to see that then after that conversation, the next time that then I was giving him oral sex, that he was more vocal and he, um, I felt more like he was in it and I felt like, you know, oh yeah, like I am pleasing him and this makes me want to please him even, even more, um, to where when, when you did bring this up of being more vocal, I like thought of that specific example and I was like, yeah, that did work <laughs> and that did feel really great. <laughs> 
it, you know, I think what you're describing there is like, you know, it's just, it's that importance of having some sexual communication, mm-hmm. right? Too many people have sex without talking about it mm-hmm. and they're just following a script and yes. that leads sex to become boring. Yeah. And so you have to say what it is that you want, what you like, what feels mm-hmm. good. And you also have to recognize that that changes over time. You know, your yeah. body changes and just, you know, what turns you on changes. So mm-hmm. just having that continued communication is a way yeah. of you know, keeping the door open to the fact that my body is changing and what mm-hmm. feels good changes over time. Yeah, and part of what you said too was to kind of not have such a narrow definition of sex. Yeah. And I think even with that, as things change over time, you know, your definition of what turns you on and what feels like good sex is going to change. Um, and I found it interesting just that in your, in your, I don't remember if it was your research or other, someone else's research, but where there was like no actual definition that everyone agreed on for right. sex. <laughs> where like literally some people were saying that like vaginal intercourse isn't sex. <laughs> right. <laughs> like uh, what? And you also have some people who say that something like deep kissing is sex, right? Yeah. So there's not 100% agreement on anything mm-hmm. that it is or isn't sex. Um, but, you know, most people do agree, you know, vaginal yeah. intercourse, anal sex, you know, yeah. They they call that sex. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, I think the more you can expand your definition, the mm-hmm. you know the more options that puts on the buffet of yeah. sexual pleasure, and you you have all these different avenues mm-hmm. you can explore, yeah. and that's really key for you know having that novelty in your sex mm-hmm. life. Yeah, huh? Um, I'm curious for you as we wrap up here. Um, what in in what ways like when I think about being a, a, a counselor, you know, part of what I love about that is that not only am I teaching my clients and they're learning from me, but that um, I'm learning so much from my clients and that it's in a way also material for my own kind of personal reflection. Um, and I'm curious if there's anything that like as you went along your research over the last decade, um, you know, how you've learned and how you've grown and how you've um maybe looked at some things differently or things that really kind of surprised you and, you know, has stuck out in terms of things that you share with friends or that you share with family or that you share with partners or whatever. I don't know if there's anything that that sticks out to you that you've really had as a takeaway from a lot of the work you've done in all the different areas. (laughs) There's a lot. (laughs) There is. Um, I I think one of the big things is that, you know, we're all kinky Mm -hmm. in some ways. You know, we're all turned on by a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And what we're told as a society, as a culture, is that, you know, sex is this very narrow thing. It's Mm -hmm. penis and vagina intercourse and a monogamous marriage. And it's like, you know, if that was the only thing you fantasized about, that would be unusual, right? It's actually normal to be kinky and to be turned on by variety and and new and different things. And so I think just expanding that definition of normal is Mm -hmm. is one of the key takeaways. Um, You know, the other thing is just learning that everybody is so different Mm -hmm. in you know, how their fantasies play out and just, you know, how sex works for them and what feels good to them. And so it's just recognizing that anytime you have, say, a new partner or or a new relationship, don't go in with too many assumptions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a new learning experience every time. Yeah. I I totally, totally agree with that. It was kind of funny as you first started sharing about how people can go about, um, sharing their fantasies with their partners and kind of allowing that time and being open-minded. Um, I am not a patient person and <laughs> I, you know, in almost every relationship I'm like, okay, what, what do you fantasize about? You know, like what turns you on about sex and just very open communicator. Um, but yeah, some, some things do kind of surprise you, but I think when you have an open mind to it and you understand that, you know, sex doesn't have to be this super, uh, strict, narrowly defined thing and that variety can be really good and that challenging yourself to have these different experiences could be really fulfilling. And even if they're not, it's a learning experience and you at least then know that that's something that you're not totally into. Um, and that it just, it can provide, I think so much for our lives and, um, sex, I think is, it's so important. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one thing I thought was interesting and I want to make sure that people, um, that listen to this as they take away some of this information, um, that you noted kind of at the end of the workshop is that it's not more sex that equals happier relationships, but that it's more quality sex. 
don't force yourself to have sex just yeah. for the sake of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's what some of these women that are like, I feel yeah. like I have to have sex yeah. are feeling. And when sex becomes this duty or obligation, it's mm-hmm. it's not fun for anyone. Yeah. And what we see in the research is that if you follow people over time who are trying to force themselves to have sex, it actually makes them want sex even less mm-hmm. and they become less happy. Yep. So that's not the right approach. It's, it's yeah. focus on the quality of the sex you're having and make mm-hmm. sure that that sex is good. Mm-hmm. And if you can get that sex to where you want it to be, then that can like spark yeah. desire for more sex in the mm-hmm. future. Definitely. Because having more mediocre sex is not good for anyone. No, nope. <laughs> it's not what anyone wants. No. <laughs> want to have good, good sex. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, the I learned so much from the workshop and even some of it, you know, I already knew, but it felt like I learned it in a, in a new, different kind of way and also had some actual research to back things up on, yeah. um, which I think can be like very validating and helpful for some people too, just knowing that these some of these things that we think are like very, very kinky and that are like so extreme are actually not so rare and that we all actually are kind of feeling the same things and wanting some of the same things. Um, So I'm really glad that I was able to attend the workshop and that you hosted it and that you've provided so many resources for people. (laughs) Um, Just honestly, you've given people so many gifts from your books to your blog. Um, And just want to say thank you so much for talking about this even more with me here after talking for like 48 hours straight. (laughs) Um, Very, very much appreciate it. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time and for answering these questions. Yeah, Thank you so much for having me. So glad you came to the workshop and I appreciate you sharing my work with with your audience. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot that we can do to help address a lot of these concerns Mm -hmm. that that your listeners have have brought up. Uh, And tapping into those fantasies, I think, is a really key way Mm -hmm. of boosting desire in relationships and improving them going forward. So Mm -hmm. I hope the book and the blog help people. Yeah, definitely. That's why I do it. I know. (laughs) Well, and you are helping so many people, already helping me. Um, And I'm definitely going to continue to share um, a lot of information about this. And um, we'll link the link to your book and to your um, website, as well as the Sexual Health Alliance um, and just all kinds of resources in the episode notes for uh, you guys listening to check out um, more information about this. And yeah, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. It's been great chatting with you. You too. Thanks. And thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening and making it to the end of this episode. Um, Definitely, definitely recommend checking out the sexandpsychology.com blog, or you can also just type in... uh, Dr. Justin Lay Miller, and it will come up. Um, and use the search function and just type in a topic or you know a fantasy um, that you have, and check out all the resources that are there. Um, I think another cool way to kind of share it with friends or your partner would be to say, you know, wow, look at this article I found, or you know, hey, can I send you this research that I just found? I think it's really interesting, um, just to kind of start the conversation. Um, and obviously, you can also share this podcast as a resource as well. Um, I would love to know kind of what you guys are taking away from this. And my goal by the end of summer is to get to a thousand reviews on iTunes. So if you haven't yet, then please, when you have a second, um, head on over to iTunes and give me a review and let me know what you're enjoying about the show. Um, I do plan on doing some more episodes related to content like this with sex and relationships because I think it is such an important topic that people don't hear enough about. Um, And so definitely plan on talking more about female masturbation, talking more about um, porn and all kinds of stuff. So um, if there's something specific you guys want covered in an episode or you have a question that you want to be answered, please shoot me an email at ask.letstalkaboutit at gmail.com. And that does it for today's episode. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate you more than you know. Um, Your kind messages and reviews mean so, so, so much. Um, So thank you and I will talk to you next time. podcast is brought to you by Wave Podcast Network. Check out all of our shows, including the Brain Candy Podcast, I Don't Get It, Coffee Convos, and Let's Talk About It.